There you go. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we read the passage about um, Jesus and the fishermen and how that they'd been out all night and they hadn't, they hadn't collected any fish and they came in and Jesus asked them to go back out again and put their nets down and they were very reluctant to do this because they were worn out and they'd been fishing all night. Um, but they did and they, and they had a huge catch. And God talked to me about that and, um, a while ago and said that when I was, I was praying for different people, but the same thing, praying over and over again, and then I would say, oh, what's the point in keep praying the same thing over and over again because I'm not seeing any answers. And God reminded me of that passage and he said, every time you feel like that, you've got to think, I'm going to throw, I'm, I'm instructing you to throw that net out one more time. Because, you know, the fishermen thought, we've thrown the net out all night and we've caught nothing. We don't want to do it again. But Jesus said, you throw it out one more time and you'll catch something. And, and I think Jesus is saying that to us too. When we think, oh, we keep praying for the same thing and nothing happens. Jesus wants to say, throw that net out one more time. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Is it still morning? Yes. <laughs> I, hope so. uh, I am, as Ruth said, I'm going to be sharing this morning about um, part of our series, Encounters with God. And I'm going to be sharing about Saul of Tarsus, who we know better as the Apostle Paul. And um, I'm going to be sharing about this man whose identity was changed following his encounter with Christ. And Saul's identity didn't change in quite the same way that Peter's did. But Saul did come to be known by a different name following his encounter with Jesus Christ. Um, Peter was one of those disciples who was with Jesus and following Jesus and was one of the 12 um, who Jesus had called to become an apostle while Jesus was still discipling and walking the earth and ministering as, uh, in the flesh. And um, Paul, quite differently, um, did not become a Christian um, during Jesus' ministry. In fact, he was very much the opposite. He persecuted the church. And he did horrible things to any Christians that he could lay hands on. And he was known at that point as Saul. Um, Saul was his Hebrew name. And if you think about famous, well-known Sauls in the Bible, we think of King Saul, who was the king who um, was, was the first king of Israel. And he was the king before David. And um, as such, he wasn't the best king in the world. Um, and so he didn't have the best reputation, but like Saul, um, Saul of Tarsus was of the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, Saul of Tarsus was very proud of his Jewish heritage, um, even though he wasn't born in the land of Israel. Um, he was very much part of a Jewish community that was very strong and very easily identifiable in the city of Tarsus. Um, Tarsus is... Um, if you look at, if you imagine this is the um, coast of Israel in the Mediterranean, and if you come up around towards Syria and then um, sort of turns a corner in, uh, into Turkey, um, Tarsus is kind of in that corner. Uh, so it's towards the southeastern um, border between Turkey and Syria. Uh, at the time, it was all part of the Roman Empire. And there was a very, very important Jewish enclave in the city of Tarsus. And um, Paul, or Saul, was part of that. He had probably, uh, scholars think, either through his grandparents or his parents, become a Roman citizen because the Jews in Tarsus had very, very strongly supported Julius Caesar on some of his campaigns in that area. And um, many people know that Saul, by trade, had been a tent maker and Tarsus was known for a place where tent making was one of the major products of the city. And they would make big marquees for the Roman military. Um, so if you ever watch movies where the, um, the Roman soldiers are you know, doing campaigns in, um, in Germany or, or wherever around the world they were having military campaigns, they'd have these big massive marquees that, um, that the, the generals and the commanders and uh, the soldiers would all stay in. 
those were mostly produced in Tarsus. Um, and so that was Paul's trade, that was most likely his parents' trade, possibly his grandparents' trade, and going on down. And um, he had been granted Roman citizenship, um, definitely through his parents, um, and probably his grandparents, um, possibly even further back. So he was a very interesting character, um, because here you have this very, very um, Jewish man who very much was proud of his Jewish heritage, his Jewish culture and traditions and customs, and he was so, uh, so fervent for his Jewish culture and faith that he moved to Jerusalem so he could study under one of the most uh, important rabbis of the time, Gamaliel. And there in Jerusalem, he became more and more zealous, and he became zealous to the point that once the disciples were there in Jerusalem and they were preaching in the temple, that Saul decided that he needed to get rid of these guys, that they were polluting the Jewish faith, and that he was going to do everything in his power. And so he actually got permission from the Sanhedrin, from the high priest, to, um, and he actually got a letter, a documented evidence, to be allowed to go throughout the region, um, and not just in Judea, um, but all beyond, and to go and try to find Christians wherever they were, and drag them out of their homes, um, and put them in chains, and bring them to Jerusalem, and put them in prison, where they would be tried, and they would be found guilty, and they would be killed. Um, so he consented to this, and he was very much a part of the um, some of the earliest persecution that existed amongst uh, against the Christians. Um, so if you can see this. I know it's quite faded, and it's it's um, somewhat intentionally faded. I, I chose the idea that it's faded um, because I think we'll start to get a clearer picture and understanding of Saul as time goes on. But this is actually the oldest um, known picture of Saul. Um, actually, by this time, he was known as Paul. And this was found in, um, in a Roman um, catacomb. And um, it is about 1,600 years old. Um, so it's the oldest known picture of him. And based on some descriptions of him, it is um, pretty much in line with what he was thought to look like. Um, I found um, this description on um, a website um, for Christianity Today, which is a Christian publication. And it says that uh, regarding Paul's appearance, this was by a second century church leader. Um, it says that Paul was a man of middling size and his hair was scanty and his legs were a little crooked and his knees were far apart. He had large eyes and his eyebrows met, and his nose was somewhat long. <laughs> and um, so if you think about it, Paul was basically short to average height. Um, so Saul, the name Saul in the Hebrew means desired, um, but Paul is the Latin equivalent of Saul, um, and Paul means short or little. Um, so that was that was probably more likely, you know, uh, how he was identifiable. Uh, so, uh, so basically, Paul was short to average in height, male pattern baldness, bow legs, bug eyes, and a unibrow, and a snout on top of it. Uh, so, um, and this this does seem to match how Paul continued to be pictured throughout his life. Um, in mosaics and paintings and statues that were produced. And um, in, the, in the scriptures themselves, we actually don't find a lot about his physical appearance, but we do read this in 2 Corinthians. His letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and if you read Paul's letters, I mean, you think, wow, this guy, I mean, could you imagine Paul walking into the room, we'd all just be like <laughs> blasted, you know. Uh, but um, his words were very, very intense. Um, and we read his words and we think, wow, I mean, he didn't mess around. Uh, 
I'm going to, um, actually, I'll share this bit first. I'm going a bit out of sequence. But um, Paul was thought to be a melancholy choleric. Okay, so now, if you were at our membership class on Monday, um, you may have heard this term. Um, but I was looking online to see, you know, I'm wondering, we're doing these membership classes, kind of some, some of the self-discovery stuff. Um, we've done Myers-Briggs, some of us, and, and, and Personality Plus. And um, so the Myers-Briggs personality type of Paul is thought to be, by the vast majority of people that I looked at, and there are, there are a lot of different websites and a lot of comments on what personality type Paul was. Um, so if you Google it, you'll find all sorts. But the majority do seem to think that Paul was an ENTJ. So now, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, it'll become clear in just a little bit. But um, so I found this. Um, this is by the Jesus Film Project, of all things. Um, so if you've heard of the Jesus Film, it was a, a film about Jesus produced in the 70s that's had a massive impact and is still having a massive impact all over the world. Um, many, many people have come to faith um, watching this film. And, um, and so the, the producers of the film um, and, um, and people who have followed on from them have continued to put resources out. Um, and so they, for some reason, decided to um, write the portrait of Paul as an ENTJ. And what it says is um, that he was extroverted, is the E, and um, that means he got energized by spending time with other people. Um, that he was intuitive, is the I, um, is the N, excuse me, uh, so E-N-T-J. Um, and that means he focuses on ideas and concepts as opposed to facts and processes. Um, the T is that he's thinking, so he makes decisions based on logic and strategic thinking. <laughs> and the J is that he's judging, um, so he prefers structure over order. And of all the personality types, the ENTJ is most suited for leadership. When it comes to mobilizing and directing others, they are naturals. Depending on their maturity and emotional health, they will lead with great skill and sensitivity. Or they'll lead like a dictator. <laughs> but the chances are that people are going to rally around them. ENTJs have a unique ability to see what needs to be done and create the structure required to accomplish it. They're decisive and resolved, and when they're challenged, they're adept at providing, uh, proving uh, that, that what they've thought all the way through about potential problems. So Paul is an ENTJ. Um, Luke gives us a lot of information about Paul in the Book of Acts. Um, you may not know this, but um, sometimes we just call it Acts. Sometimes we call it the Book of Acts. Um, the full name of it is the Book of the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and so Paul being one of the apostles who was quite a mover and shaker, as we might say today, in the early church, um, a big portion of the Book of Acts is about him and what he did and how he um, came to faith and brought the gospel around the world. And I'm going to um, share his story about how he came to faith through an encounter with Christ in just a moment. Uh, but I want us to get a sense of who this man was, um, and so it says, Paul was a big personality and quickly became a vital force in the early church, and it's his style of leadership that helped the church grow so fast. Here are some reasons it's safe to assume that Paul was an ENTJ. Number one, Paul always inspired followers. The first time we see Paul, it's in the seventh chapter of Acts. Luke calls him by the Hebrew name Saul and tells us that when the Sanhedrin stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr, witnesses who got involved stripped off their outer garments and laid them at Paul's feet. So now that's a sign that Paul was very, very, very well respected. And, um, and not only that, but that Paul was somehow instrumental in the stoning of Stephen. Um, and um, it, Continues here. This not only tells us that Paul approved of this action, but it demonstrated that he was well known and respected. Almost immediately, we see Paul going from house to house, dragging off Christian converts and throwing them in prison. Luke tells us that Paul wasn't doing this alone. He singled out because he's going to have a life changing interaction with the risen Jesus. But he's also singled out because he's leading this persecution. 
Paul went to the high priest and requested that letters be sent to the synagogues in Damascus to alert them that he was coming to arrest any Christians in their communities. Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus, which tells us that even the high priest recognized Paul's leadership and agreed with his strategy. Um, and I'm actually going to read that before we read more about his personality. Um, it's quite dark. Hopefully you can see that ball along with me. Um, so this is from Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> And it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death, his death being Stephen's. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women committing them to prison. And um, I'm going to jump in, jump ahead a little bit in Paul's story. And so we find out that Paul um, has gotten this letter from the high priest, um, and it's been sent ahead of him, and he keeps a copy with him, as he is now on his way to the Syrian city of Damascus <laughs> to go and see if he can find any Christians there in that city. And it was well known that there were um, a good number of them who had fled there once they started to be persecuted in Jerusalem. Um, and so, um, so Paul's on his way uh, from Jerusalem to Damascus, and we read this. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that he, so that if he found any who were of the way, which is a name for the early church, the way, followers of the way, um, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. <coughs> As he journeyed, he, became, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Now imagine this. Imagine being in Paul's company. Or, if you can, imagine being Paul, or someone like Paul, who is so fervent and so intense about what you believe that you're going to harm and potentially see murdered anybody who believes differently than you. You're a radical zealot. This was Saul of Tarsus. And he's on the road to Damascus, and this light from heaven shines around him. And he fell to the ground. No, I've done it. Oh, thank you. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, <laughs> Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So... Saul's encounter with the risen Lord Jesus is quite a bit different than Peter's encounter with Christ. Um, Jesus told Peter, Simon Peter, that he would no longer be known as Simon, but he would now be called Peter, or originally would have been Cephas, which is the Aramaic word for stone. Uh, Peter is our English translation, or uh, Pietro um, in Latin. Uh, Petros in the Greek. Um, and so the transformation that comes and the new identity that comes for Saul being Paul is something that was done a bit more intentionally. Um, whether it's something that he himself chose to do or whether it's something that um, the church leaders that he was working with 
conferred with him and said, let's take this approach. Let's, um, but as we read on, what we find out is that Jesus commissioned Saul of Tarsus to go to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, um, and to the children of Israel, and to kings, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Jesus chose him for this purpose, and was sending him. Um, and that's what an apostle is, that's what it means. It means a sent one, um, one who has been sent for a purpose or a mission. And um, so, being one who is sent to the Gentiles, um, we, uh, most people believe that Paul slash Saul was always known by both names because he lived in a Romanized city in Tarsus um, that he would have been known to the non-Jewish people that he grew up with as Paul, uh, which was quite common that Jewish people would have their, their Jewish name, but they would also have sort of their, their more general name that the Gentiles, the non-Jews, would call them. Um, so Paul is thought to have always been a name that he was known by, by the non-Jews. And since he was being sent by Jesus to go and, and preach the gospel to especially the Gentiles, um, it was thought that Paul decided to um, take on that Latin name and be known by that Latin name so he could be more relatable as he was um, speaking mostly to a, um, a non-Jewish audience as he would go out and minister. Um, so his rebranding of himself um, was done quite intentionally. Um, later on in scripture, Paul says that he be has become all things to all people. And it's not that um, the choosing of um, the name Paul over his Jewish name Saul was part of that process. It was part of him uh, making himself able to relate better to the non-Jew. Um, it is also quite interesting that Paul's transformation was so radical because as one who had been so zealous for his Jewish faith, his Jewish customs and tradition, and for the Jewish people, um, he suddenly is the one who, when he sees non-Jews being treated as second-class citizens within the new church, um, as both Jews and Gentiles are coming to faith in Jesus, um, Paul is the one who calls it out. Paul is the one who uh, blasts Peter and says, how dare you refuse to sit when we all gather together with the non-Jewish people? How dare you not break bread with them? How dare you treat them like second-class citizens? That's really radical. If you can imagine this extremely zealous essentially terrorist who had been um, fighting and, and, and consenting to the murder of Christians, suddenly becoming the one who says, not only am I now a Christian, but Jesus Christ has changed me so much that I'm going out and I'm preaching the gospel. I'm going out and I'm preaching the gospel to people that, you know, they weren't Jewish, so we barely even consider them truly human. And yet, they were the people that he witnessed to the most and the most fervently. So jumping back to his ENTJ personality, after Paul is converted, the disciples are nervous. Ananias was told by Jesus to go and to pray over this, this man who was still known as Saul, um, and that Jesus had spoken to Saul as he was praying in his three days of blindness and fasting. Um, and Jesus had told Saul that a man would be coming and would be praying over him. And so Ananias um, gets this word from the Lord to, to go to a certain place and find Saul and pray over him. And Ananias is thinking, what? <laughs> you want me to pray over this man who wants to murder me? <laughs> Are you joking? 
And yet, he was faithful to do this. Saul had inspired so much fear in the early church that they were afraid of him. They didn't want to walk him into their midst. They probably wondered if he was actually coming in as a spy. But, again we read, after Paul is converted, the disciples are nervous. Maybe this was all an elaborate trick to infiltrate the church. Almost immediately, Paul starts wandering around Jerusalem and telling others about Jesus nearly getting himself killed by some Greek Jews. From this point on, the, mo the momentum of the New Testament shifts from Jesus' disciples toward Paul. While he still respects the authority of Peter and the others, Paul begins to grow in influence and overshadows, overshadows the others. None of this is Paul's intention. Instead, it's a function of his personality and his calling. When an ENTJ sees a need or an opportunity, they jump. Immediately strategize a plan to solve a problem or capitalize on a specific opportunity, and people are drawn to their common sense solutions and enthusiastic plans. ENTJs aren't overly sentimental, and this would explain how Paul was so um, really easily able to separate himself from his Jewish heritage and his Jewish way of thinking and being and doing things. It's interesting to look at how Paul's, Paul views his past life. He was born to Jewish parents, but was also a Roman citizen. He studied Jewish law under a well-known and much respected rabbi. He was well on his way toward becoming a Pharisee of some renown. And when he meets Jesus, he abandons his past completely without any sentimentality. ENTJs aren't prone to fits of nostalgia or romancing the past. When new and better information comes, they quickly and easily abandon what no longer makes sense. They're always looking toward the future. When Paul writes to the churches about turning from their old lives and embracing their new identities, it's from the perspective of an ENTJ for whom the process is effortless. Does that sound like any of you? Or do you read that and think, wow, <laughs> turning away from my old ways, that process is anything but effortless, or something in the middle. This helped Paul embrace his new identity so profoundly and communicate, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. And that's from Philippians 3.8. Paul was not overly concerned that he was liked. We see that throughout Paul's ministry, he wasn't afraid to take risks that resulted in beatings and stonings. In his letters, he had no problem calling out individuals who were undermining the gospel. And sometimes he did it by name. In Philippians 4.2, he wrote, I appeal to Eodia, and I plead with Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. And that was quite mild. <laughs> he said much harder things than that. When Paul receives word that some doubt his apostleship, he insists to the church at Corinth that this simply isn't justified. He, re he assures them that he is not inferior to the most esteemed apostles and tells them, that this has been proven with signs and wonders. And you can read that in 2 uh, Corinthians 12, 11, and 12. Others might worry that this doesn't appear very humble, but not Paul. His work depends upon his reputation, and he will defend it. In many ways, the single-minded focus of the ENTJ is admirable, but it can also be a curse. Some ENTJs lack the interest and sensitivity to work through intricate personal problems which means that they leave hurt feelings and angry people in their wake. And the time they were trying to save by being abrupt and forceful gets spent on trying to smooth over ruffled feathers. Uh, and so hopefully that gives you a bit of a sense of who Paul is. Uh, and again, this is kind of looking back with a modern filter to some extent and looking at what he's written and what's been written about him 
and, um, and saying, okay, somebody who uses these words and this approach and does the things that he has done, um, you know, they, they seem to fit this um, general personality trait. But I think that, uh, that they did a good job of explaining him. Um, I'm not going to go a whole lot into the melancholy choleric other than to say that I am also a melancholy choleric. <laughs> and um, so when I read that, I'm like, okay, I relate to that. And um, as a, the melancholy part is that we're very detail focused. Um, we like to make sure that you know, we have lists, we're orderly, um, and, um, and sometimes we can get so caught up in our order and our lists that we get into our own heads. Um, and, <laughs> and the choleric part, though, is that we're doers. Um, we also want to get things done, and we'll jump right in, and we'll see a need, and we'll say, okay, all right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet that need. And then you write lists about it. <laughs> and then we write lists about it, because we're also no one um, And um, so um, Paul has been described, as many, many people over time, as a bull in a china shop. Um, something or someone more likely to cause a lot of damage um, when surrounded by so many fragile things, whether the bull targets those fragile things or not, um, whether it's just because the bull is simply too powerful um, and clumsy to gingerly step past in order to preserve the delicate Del delicately balanced bowls and saucers and cups that are stacked up. Um, Paul didn't worry about that. He was of the approach, you know, let's deal with the truth, we'll worry about your feelings later. Uh, and some other ENTJs that you will have heard of um, are Bill Gates, um, founder of Microsoft, um, former U.S. President Barack Obama, uh, well-known British singer Adele, um, Paul's favorite person ever in the world, Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now, now, don't hold this against the Apostle Paul, that, that you know, he's also an ENTJ like Margaret Thatcher. Uh, Steve Jobs um, of Apple, and um, historically, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, famous French or infamous French dictator. Um, so this rebranding of Saul into Paul, this transformation that came because of his miraculous encounter with Jesus Christ, um, made it so that um, really, chances are, we have now all had the opportunity to come to faith. There's a strong likelihood that if Paul had not been as fervent for the name of Jesus, for the gospel message, and for the commission that Jesus gave him to go to the Gentiles, to preach before kings, and even the children of Israel, chances are most of us would not have had the same opportunities to come to faith in Jesus Christ that we've been presented with. Um, now, Jesus works in many, many ways. He may have found another vessel another way. Um, he, um, you know, there's something called natural revelation, where because God created the world, um, that um, it is evident that there is a creator. And so some people eventually start to understand God through creation. So there are other ways that people can come to faith. But Paul made Christianity accessible. The doors that were closed to the non-Jewish person who was interested in Jesus Christ suddenly were opened because Paul made sure that those doors that Jesus opened did not get shut again. So we all have a lot to thank Paul for. And um, in the scripture that talks about Paul and his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, Jesus says, Paul, it must be hard to kick against the goads. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to, as I had said on Monday evening, um, I'm going to share a bit about my story and how um, I was kicking against the goads as well. So a goad 
Um, you ever heard the term uh, that somebody's been goaded along? Um, so it's the same idea, but prodded along. Um, so a goad, um, there were several versions of it. And one of the main ones was called an ox goad. And if you um, have ever seen um, portrayals of oxen plowing a field, um, often there'd be two side by side, and they'd have, you know, they'd be sort of bound together. And then there's somebody driving the ox. And it looks like there's a big stick between the two. Um, and that is often the uh, ox goad. And uh, it ends with a point like this. Some of them aren't quite as fancy. Some of them are just big, long wooden sticks. Um, but they're pointy. And the person driving the oxen um, uses them to poke and prod the ox to go the right direction. And if the ox starts to go the wrong way, um, they'll get prodded to keep them going where the person who is um, giving the direction intends for them to go. And um, if an ox gets upset and kicks against the goat, it's going to hurt. Um, it's bad for the ox. It's bad for the person who is um, leading. And it can be very bad for somebody that the ox might plow down. Um, now, there are also horse goats. So if you can imagine this, um, one of these on either side of a horse coming from a chariot or a cart, um, if the horse were to turn too quickly, um, it would jab the horse in the side. And it would keep, um, it was meant as a safety device to keep um, carts and chariots from as easily tumbling over, um, or horses from deciding to suddenly just go the opposite direction. Um, and so if you imagine yourself kicking against the goats, I mean, that's quite painful. And basically what Jesus was saying is, Paul, you're going the wrong way. God is saying this way, and you've chosen to go that way. And so Jesus basically had an intervention with him <laughs> and commissioned him to do a new thing, called him out of the darkness that he had been in. And I think that blindness was sort of a timeout period for Paul. I think he probably needed it to stop and think and pray and evaluate and truly seek the Lord. Um, because he hadn't really been seeking the Lord. I have no doubt that in his training to become um, a Pharisee of Pharisees, as was said about him, that there were many, many times that he would pray. Um, and many of those prayers um, were probably quite heartfelt. But have you ever had a season in your life where you're praying but it's kind of a one-way thing because you're asking, you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, you're not actually listening to the Lord. Um, I think that's probably what had happened. That he wasn't actually paying attention to God. That God got his attention and said, stop. You're kicking against the goats. You're hurting yourself and you're hurting a lot of other people. Why are you persecuting me? And um, and when we hear Jesus ask Paul, why are you persecuting me? We probably wonder, how is it that Jesus is persecuting, um, how, being persecuted by Paul? And the thing is, is that Jesus is the head of his church. And so if any member of the body of Christ is being persecuted, we're all being persecuted. We're all one body. And Jesus being the head, he is also being persecuted. So now I'm going to jump to a different story of a different person. I'm going to share my story. Um, I was saying last week and encouraging everybody that we want to hear your encounter with God, your encounter with Christ, um, whatever it may be, because um, we very, very strongly believe that um, how you have come to faith, how you have encountered Jesus, how he has spoken to you is important and is valuable and is helpful to somebody. And um, so I thought, well, you know what? I can't just put that out there and not be willing to share mine. So, uh, so I said, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll jump in and I'll go first. So um, for me, I was, um, as a young boy, I was raised... Um, in a Catholic family, 
um, my heritage is um, Sicilian, and as such, um, you, you're Sicilian, you're Catholic, and it was just sort of, you know, all one thing. Uh, and um, as a little boy, we went to church, and then my family moved away to Southern California, from Northern California, and away from the influence of my grandparents and extended family, um, we stopped going to church. And I was young enough, I didn't really realize what happened. I just thought, okay, well, we're in a different place, and okay. Um, and then we moved back some years later, lived with my, my grandmother, my mom's mom, and, um, and so she um, put a lot of pressure on my parents to have it, at least one of the grandchildren, me or my brother, go to church with her. And, um, and so I was the one who decided, okay, we can go. Um, and, uh, and again, I was young enough not to really question it, but we were going and, and had to go to these catechism classes in the Catholic Church. And I just thought, oh, what is this? This is, this is so boring. <laughs> and um, I couldn't stand it. And just, you know, the incense and the bells and the, you know, you know just hated every minute of it. And, um, and so once we moved out of my grandmother's home into our own family home, a couple towns away, um, there was no more church again. And so I'm like, oh, great. So, um, and we built the home that my, uh, my parents, well, my mother is now living in, and um, built it from scratch. It's a, it's a custom, quite nice home on a good-sized piece of land. And uh, it got the attention of the local Mormon community, um, quite a bit of quite a few Mormons in the area that I grew up in. And um, I always joke that they saw a big house and they thought, ooh, you can store a lot of food in there, because that's, that's something that they do. Um, they store it for the, uh, uh, for the end times. And, um, or you can fit a lot of people in there, a big family, because yeah, that's another thing they do is have lots of children. Um, so we had a, um, a Mormon who was, um, we found out much later, was a bishop in the Mormon church who would come, and he had gone to school with my mother. Um, so I think out of that connection that they had in their childhood, um, they, it was decided that he would be a good one to try to, you know, to evangelize, to witness to our family. And so she felt bad that you know, she didn't want to shut out this man that she had known from childhood. So she would let him in sometimes, and he would talk, and he would ask us some very pointed questions about what we believed. And I um, uh, hadn't really thought about this stuff in much detail. It was only probably about maybe 14 at the time, 13, 14. And so I started to think, well, maybe I should really try to figure out what I believe <clears throat> about spiritual things. And so I thought about it, and I thought about it. And, and I decided, you know what, I don't believe any of it. I don't believe anything spiritual. I don't think there is or ever was any god or gods or any of that. Um, I don't think that religion is legitimate. I think it's all superstitious. It's all foolish nonsense. And if all these silly religious people would just get over their foolish, superstitious ways, all of mankind could come together, and through science we could solve all the world's problems through rational thinking. And um, so, yes, I became an atheist. Um, at a fairly young age, and over time I became a very staunch atheist. And um, as time went on in high school, I joked that I became a bit of an evangelical atheist, where if somebody was wearing a cross, or a Jewish star, or had the, the Sikh um, the turban with a little sword, or anything like that, we were in quite a relatively diverse area. Um, any kind of religious symbolism, um, I would try to convince them that their beliefs were just superstitious. And um, fast forward a little bit, my brother goes off to university. Um, my mother realizes that my time to go off to university is not too far down the road. Uh, she was a stay-at-home mother at this point. She was getting very um, clingy um, because you know the, the baby would be flying the coop and then it would just be she and my dad in this big house rattling around. And so she um, would ask me 20 questions every time I got back from school. Like literally, so, so the house is quite long, and so I, we would enter through the garage, um, I would open the door, and my foot would not even hit the ground inside of the house before she started asking me all these questions. Um, 
what did you eat today? What did you learn? Who did you see? What did you talk to? What were they wearing? You know, I'm just like, whoa, okay, enough. <laughs> Let's, look, can I just come in and put my book bag down and, and have a seat and maybe have a little snack and it's a long walk and, you know, all this stuff. And, um, and but every day it was like this and I was like, oh, it's too much. And uh, I was always quite independent. And, um, and so um, one day I came home and she wasn't there. This is nice. I can have, have, it should probably be home in a minute, but you know I can just come in and, and kind of relax and have a little snack. And you know, but this is too good to be true. This never happens. So, uh, well, let me make sure that I actually am home alone. And so I went and I checked through the whole house, um, and yeah, nobody's home. Okay, great. And I still had my book bag with me, and, and back to my bedroom a second time after checking, and I put my bag down on the ground, and as I'm here, somebody behind me calls my name. And I checked, I knew nobody was home. So I very, very slowly stood up, and I was frightened. I was terrified because my first thought was that we've been broken into and we're being robbed. I don't know why I jumped to that conclusion, but that's what I thought. And I very slowly turned around, and Jesus was standing behind me. And I did not believe in Jesus. I did not believe in visions. I did not believe in anything supernatural. Everything was rational, logical, explainable. And yet, this is happening. And he says, Todd, go to church. And if my job could have been on the ground, it would have been. And I felt like I stood there for a long, long time. Uh, probably it was only a few seconds, but it felt like hours. And eventually I started to try to rationalize and explain to myself what had just happened. <coughs> and then it was quite a hot day. Uh, we had blinds in my bedroom that were shut, but light would come through a little bit. And so I thought, well, that's what I saw, uh, because he was all kind of ghostly white, um, and um, and it had not not a halo that you would see in a picture, but he had a glow around him, and he was glow. I mean, uh, and I could see that he had eyes. I could see that he had hair. I could see the holes in his hands, but I couldn't um, tell you what color his hair was, um, what color his eyes were, anything like that. And the vision, he, he wasn't quite full life size. He was a bit um, diminutive. He was probably about this high above the ground, and so about like this. Um, and so I thought it was just the light. That's what I saw, just the light. And I was fine with that for a few days. And then I thought, wait a minute. I didn't just see him, I heard him. So I thought, well, what did I hear? Because that can't have been, can't be real. There's no way that that could have happened. That is not possible. And uh, so I decided, well, it was the air conditioning coming on because it was on a, a sensor. If it got too hot in the house, it would just automatically kick on. And it was just right across the hall from my bedroom. And I thought, okay, that's what I heard. It was, it was the air conditioning kicking on. And then pretty quickly, maybe a few hours later after thinking that, I thought, the air conditioner could say, Todd, go to church. Anything that sounds like that. Like the air conditioner knows my name because he knew my name. And for several more days, I think it was about six days total, um, I tried to deny and rationalize and justify and explain away. And finally, I couldn't anymore. I was at the end of myself. We were singing that lyric in that song earlier. I had come to the end of myself. And I finally had to say, you know what? This really happened. Jesus came and he found me and he knew my name and he talked to me and he said, talk to church. So I need to go to church. And um, I had been invited to church by a lot of different people. So I went and tried all these different churches. And um, the rest is too long of a story to, to tell all of it. Uh, it's been a wild ride ever since. Um, but um, through the process of 
learning who Jesus is and learning about his call in my life, um, he has called me to um, certain parts of the world. Um, he um, called me to Africa, um, where I preached and taught, and uh, he called me uh, to India, uh, he's called me to many different nations, um, and he's called me and Ruth together here to Shrewsbury. And, um, and so uh, this is my testimony. This is my encounter with Christ, and this is how it's changed me. A tiny bit of how it's changed me. And you heard a tiny bit of how it changed Saul into the Apostle Paul. How has Jesus Christ changed you? Your story won't probably be like mine. It might have some similarities. Um, I share mine along with Paul's because when people hear my story, they're like, oh my gosh, that's like Paul. Um, and, um, and I do see certain similarities um, and certain differences. But we want to hear your story. If your story is something like, well, I was raised in a Christian home, and I just sort of always knew, and you know, and I, I just always went to church, and I always believed, and I, you know, it was just sort of, you know, there was no big aha moment. I love those stories. People hear my story, and especially the latter bits when I strayed terribly from the Lord, and how He delivered me from drugs, He delivered me from addiction, He delivered me from depression. Um, they, people hear all of this and they think, wow, I wish I had a story like you. And I think, I wish I had a story like you. You have all, who have just always known and have been faithful and have you know, more or less stayed on the straight and narrow. Um, because to me, that's powerful. I think a lot of um, parents would love to hear that story. Christian parents who are trying to raise their way, their children in the ways of the Lord would love to hear that story to know that it's possible. Um, your story is powerful. My story is the story of a stubborn man who was kicking against the goats, um, who needed a lot of correction and who needed um, some hard intervention. Um, your story doesn't have to be that. It might be that. But it's important and it's valuable and we want to hear it. Um, so with that said, I'm going to wrap up this part of the service and um, hand it over to Ruth. Um, we're going to do a little bit.